Hello there, and welcome to Success as a Student, a skills podcast for students and anyone who wants to develop key skills that will help them in being successful. My name is Alexander Wood. I create online skills content for the University of Derby. Outside of work, I am a trustee, a chairperson of a youth group, and the University of Derby Graduate of the Year. In this series, we focus on how you can develop skills that will help you to succeed in your university study, your career, and in your personal development all by interviewing experienced University of Derby staff and successful students. In this episode, we're discussing problem solving with Professor Ian Turner. We're going to look at how you can develop your creative mindset, how you can solve problems under pressure, and how you can develop your problem solving skills both inside and outside of university. But first, I actually thought it would be good just to discuss a bit more about what problem solving is and how problem solving can include problems within your degree. For example, thinking about what the best strategy is when you are completing an assignment or when you're working out what to do with your exam revision. It can include solving problems such as how best to work on a group project. But it can also include much more smaller and everyday things, such as how do I organise my time so that I can make sure that I have good focus when I'm trying to revise. So problem solving skills are much broader than when you're just solving a problem. They actually apply to when you think about doing almost anything on your degree. Provided that you're thinking and there are different options, you can use your problem solving skills to weigh up which option to pick and why. When you've started developing a creative mindset, you may actually start noticing there are more options available to you, and you might also start ruling out some options quite quickly. So that's all about what problem solving is, and what we actually mean and what we're going to discuss further in this podcast, but I'll be interested in hearing about what Ian says about problem solving later on. So hello Ian, Uh, would you like to introduce yourself to the audience? Uh, Hi Alex, yes I'd love to. Um, So my name's uh, Professor Ian Turner and I work in the Centre for Excellence in Learning and Teaching at the University of Derby. So what do people mean by problem solving? It's a really interesting question for me, Alex, because problem solving, I'm a scientist by background, is very, very important to our discipline. And I guess for me, problem solving is two things. When you're encountering a situation, a problem, working out, first of all, what that problem actually is, and then coming up with a solution to it. Um, And when I say a solution to it, sometimes that is coming up with different solutions and then working out which one will actually resolve the problem itself. Um, I'm not sure if that's a very science-specific view of problem solving. I know that you have a different background to me, so I'd be interested in your thoughts as well. But it's very much coming coming up with solutions to an identified problem yeah i agree with the problem solving to me i did a lot of it in negotiation and it's all about looking at what the options are like you said and evaluating those options and coming up with a proper outcome that is the best one going forward and trying to use it and then if it doesn't work trying something else and being able to adapt and be creative Mm. and a lot of it has creativity in it which is something i'm going to ask about later uh, so do you, would you accept that as well that definition yeah yeah i think i think that's fair uh, and you know sometimes the identifying the problem bit is the real hard bit now knowing what you're trying to come up with the solutions for it, yeah. it is part of the challenge in, in problem solving problem solving skills yeah i definitely agree it's something that we are going to talk about in another episode of this podcast about reflection is how you can work out what the areas that you want to work on that you can then use your problem solving skills to solve in the long term because that's an area that problem solving can apply to. I think it's something that can apply to a very broad range of things, um, mm-hmm. such as how can you solve and improve your organisation, how can you solve your assessment problems and work out what to do, and things like mm-hmm. that. But why do you think it's important that students or listeners to this podcast invest in skills such as problem solving? There's probably lots of answers to that. I mean, first of all, I think perhaps very importantly, employers say that this is a skill that they want to uh, have in graduates. And I know you're a recent graduate, so perhaps you can uh, be your view on that, be interesting. I think more generally, it's hard to think of any kind of aspect of the world where 
you aren't encountering problems, whether that's something very, very, very small, you know, to do with your job or your work or your social life to the, the big issues. You know, I'm thinking like climate change. Yeah. I mean, these, they, they, these are all problems and we need individuals and groups of people to come together to um, come up with as many different solutions as possible, test them individually and off each other in order to come up with things which are going to help us. Um, yeah. Life is full of problems yeah. and solutions we come up with together are uh, the way to overcome those. I think what was really interesting about what we said there is about how problems can be different and relative depending on their scale. So you can have problems which are really small, such as how can you solve this query that someone's given to you in the workplace or problems that are big, such as how can you fix the world? Um, and that's one of the reasons why I think it's important. So you said about how it's important to employers. Well, as you said, everything you do, but everything that comes across you, that could be difficult. You need the skills to approach that in the right way. Yeah. And I think yep. that's something that's very valued because if you can learn to do that, you can often get better outcomes from what you do. Mm. I, mean, I can give you two really extreme examples which happened to me uh, mm. uh, only in the last day. So <laughs> the small example, I've got a frozen pipe on my washing machine in the garage at the minute. Um, and it's not working. So come up with some solutions. So identify the problem, first of all. I know where the frozen pipe is. Solutions, I could lag the pipe. I, I could pour some boiling water over the pipe. Um, I realise both those aren't going to actually defrost the ice enough. Boiling water in the garage is not good on the floor. And eventually I came up with a solution of using the hairdryer, plugged in the hairdryer and put it over the pipe uh, and that defrosted it. So several different options. Some I didn't actually test, but kind of mentally tested. Uh, and one I did, and in this case, uh, resolved the problem. And then a much bigger issue, I'm thinking about learning and teaching at the university. Uh, and what happens, you know, next year and the year on, um, as we recover from the COVID-19 pandemic and blended teaching. So a very small yeah. and a very big problem, both which use problem solving skills. And both in very different contexts that you probably use creative solutions for. I think that's one of the things that I really like about problem solving is that the fact that you can, you don't always have, you're not always limited to options or, and if you think about what the alternatives are, you can come up with some things that are very creative. Sometimes you're very limited. Other times you can be expressive and come up with really good ideas. Uh, I'm just thinking about one of the problems that came to me and something that which relates to an episode that I talked about with digital capabilities. I was interviewing someone called Matt Galuli. I don't know if you know who he is. Mm. Yeah, he, he, we're discussing about digital, learning digital software and how you make yourself better and self-solve issues. Well, that uh, learning to self-solve issues is related to problem solving. So I had I was doing a live stream last week, and my computer broke five minutes beforehand, and there was something going wrong. I didn't know what it was, and it it was dropped frames. I didn't know what they were. I didn't know why they caused it, but my computer was going red, and the live stream was saying it's not working. But you use the problem sol solving skills to first of all work out what the problem was okay, what's causing this, what's changed, and then I solved it within five minutes. And I only did that because of digital capabilities and problem-solving skills mm -hmm. and and learning to self-help and those skills. So actually, they can be really important on big things and small things. So like you said, the small thing for you that you were talking about, that could probably have big impacts, couldn't it, mm -hmm. in yeah. terms of... You know, I don't I mean, understand it that much, but yeah. heating and things like that could impact. <laughs> it's really interesting what you just said there, the example about the laptop. Uh, and um, it brings to mind a thought which can sometimes be a barrier for people in problem solving skills is, I mean, how did you stop yourself panicking there? I mean, you needed to get your laptop ready, but you didn't panic and, and, and you kept that kind of you know frame of mind on a, on a solution. Because if you if you start panicking, you, you come, come up with no ideas. Mm. So what I did then is I thought about, okay, I've got five minutes to get this sorted. And I tried to come up with solutions. I wouldn't say I was the calmest person in the world, but uh, mm -hmm. I thought about what can I do? And the thing is, when you've got a problem like that, where you're under pressure, if you think about panicking and you, that's not going to solve the problem, I tried to think, okay, and keep myself in the mindset of what can I do in this time to help resolve this problem? Because mm -hmm. the best option for me, go to IT. But in five minutes, are oh, you going to fix that problem? No. So I thought about what my options were in the time. I tried to restart my computer. That didn't fix it. I tried restarting the software. That didn't fix it. The old on and off tricks. It turned out it was OneDrive was the issue. So I looked at what changed. I tried to keep myself calm and thinking about what can I do in this time and focusing on that panicking won't make this problem go away. 
Mm. So I don't know what you think about that approach. Yeah, I think I think it's very sensible. I think you've got a very analytical approach to that, which is another skill that employers like, which I think f- feeds into pro- problem solving skills quite quite a lot. Uh, I, I guess also you kind of well, what's the worst case scenario? Mm. Well, I have to postpone the talk or delay the talk, and it's very rare in my life anyway that my problem solving skills by not being able to come up with a solution have effect on the health or. or, or of, of me or an individual they're normally local problems so it's never the end of the world if i can't resolve something in a, in a short time period yeah and just thinking about what you were saying there even if you can't solve the problem fully is there mm. a way that you can solve it somewhat so is there a way that you could deliver this in an alternate means so for example i've got my computer which, which is my work computer could i in 10 minutes boot up my laptop and teach it from my laptop. I heard about a, a staff member at a university, I don't think it was this one, who got trapped in a lift. And he decided he was going to deliver the class from his phone. No video. Mm. And he taught the class from his phone in the lift using this very limited signal because mm. his problem-solving brain said, okay, I can't. what can I do? What are my options? And he worked out that that's an option that gives a outcome, not necessarily the best outcome, but a workable outcome in the time scale. So Assessing time yeah, scales yeah. and outcomes is good. Yeah, I think it's brilliant. I mean, um, I think sometimes people get very focused in problem solving skills and working out what the problem is, or perhaps even what they cannot do. Where obviously, to be successful in problem solving, you need to work out what you could do or can do. So don't spend time being remorseful about I can't do this. I haven't got video. I can't, you know, think about what what is available to me, um, and coming up with solutions rather than over-focusing on the problem. Yeah. I've got, I think it's really relevant what you're saying there and what we've just discussed about like the available outcomes and solutions. But um, something that is very easy to focus on in in that time is the blame game. And I Mm. find this a lot in people who solve problems, which is they look for what's at fault. Mm. Whereas what I would recommend doing is forget, especially if you've got to just fix something in the short term, forget who's at fault, forget, what's gone wrong focus on the on the solving it and focus on the present you Mm. can look back later and say you were the person to blame or you're the one who's got got this wrong but that doesn't matter and if you've got a short time to fix something don't focus on that focus on how you can spend that time fixing it yeah i agree with what you just said there and i I guess this pulls in a whole host of other skills which are important to students and the the workforce, things like um, collaboration and leadership um, and even, though I don't like the word authority, but actually focusing on the immediate issue before you go back and reflect on and work out where this um, problem stemmed for and taking appropriate remedial action to stop it happening in the future. Yeah, I think that'd be really useful for things like group work that students undertake, but also working in the future in careers uh, or on any projects that people work on uh, Mm. together. Mm. So in the second half of this interview with Professor Ian Turner, what we discuss is about the creative mindset. I just wanted to highlight here how the creative mindset adds the links to problem solving. And I think it links really clearly because being creative means you open up more options and more possibilities to solve your problem with. Often, people who are not successful see only the options that are laid out in front of them, whereas a creative person, when problem-solving, will often find and make more options available to them. As I discussed in a lot of the Enterprise episodes in this series, actually, a successful person will make options available and will find new ways, and part of that skill is through creativity. So... Learning to have a creative mindset and being able to broaden those options available is really important when solving any problem or when thinking about any strategy going forwards. Ian is actually one of the most creative people that I know, so it was actually really interesting to hear when I recorded this podcast how Ian is able to think creatively and how he can creatively approach a problem, but also how he developed those skills in creativity. So... I think what I'd like to ask you now, Ian, is about mm. you and your problem-solving skills. So for me, like I said at the intro, I think you're really creative. Mm. I just wondered, how did you become creative and how do you manage to be creative in the things that you make? Well, thanks, Alex. Um, it's nice of you to say so. I mean, 
in my early career, I never really disguised myself as creative. And it's a label, actually, that other people have put on me several times. Um, and I think at the heart of it is I enjoy it. I mean, <laughs> genuinely, I like coming up with different ways to do things. I like challenging myself and challenging others. And, um, you know, though it's many years now, having been a student myself, you know, I don't I want the best things that I saw to be experienced by my students. And I don't want to do the things that I didn't enjoy myself. Um, um, and part of that is, you know, when I've got a problem, like teaching a difficult concept to students is thinking about different ways that I could present that, mm. um, you know, and some of those ways work for some students, some don't and evaluating those, you know, in the classroom and then, uh, a key skill is adapting what you're doing to make sure that, you know, you respond to the immediate kind of needs of the student. Um, I'm sure you've seen many good, um, you know, lecturers, of course, your yeah. study, they use all kinds of different approaches, mm. um, many different creative approaches, I'm sure. Um, I'm just one example of that. Yeah. One thing that I do is I look at people like yourself are an example to people who are really creative and do things that work. And I see, think about what they've done and seeing if I can add a twist to that. I think uh, what you were saying though about your creativity is that first of all, you looked at outcomes. So you're saying you're looking at how can I get the best outcomes and thinking about what the best solution is or best idea is for your creativity to get outcomes out there. Second of all, mm. uh, you reflected on what your first of all performance was. So if you've done it before, how did it go first time? You your reflection skills there, and then the third thing you said you did is that you adapted. So you reflected on it and then made changes to see if you could get the better outcomes going forward. Mm. I mean, as I sit here thinking, hearing what you're saying, I think a lot of creativity came from me from my use of things like analogy. Mm. So, I mean, I, I, a lot of my problems I face are dealing with how to deliver. When I say the word difficult concepts theories and words that people haven't heard before mm. uh, and uh, i'm a biologist by training and a lot of what we talk about is stuff you can't see or imagine or never heard of before so i use well how can i find an analogy to this in the real world or using props that help create a visual cue for that uh, and that's really helped me come up with alternative you know solutions um which hopefully benefit the students um and that's what people sometimes call creative when you bring in a, a washing line to explain a dna molecule people think you're being incredibly creative but really i was just thinking i had a problem how can i show you dna because i can't show you your cell so well i'll make the dna big and i'll use the washing line as a symbolism for that and you know, um, that was the solution i came up with uh, and in, in this case that solution was deemed effective by the students who enjoyed it yeah, I think it's a really good solution to use. One key point of this episode is about creativity in the sense of yep. looking at the outcomes and not being restricted to the things that people have already done before. Um, yep. Something which I think you showed there in your example of your teaching mm -hmm. is that you look at how can I best achieve the outcomes, even if it's using things that I knew. So you thought, okay, analogy, and then you went down that pathway of what analogy can I use that's better? And then you reflected on it over time and improved that and saw what people were thinking. And I think that's really key to uh, problem solving skills. Yeah, I agree with you, Alex. Um, and I think sometimes, and I don't know if you agree or disagree, that creativity is kind of mixed up with kind of innovation. Yes. And I don't think you thing. necessarily need to do anything brand new to be creative. You haven't got to come up with an idea that nobody in the world has ever come up with mm -hmm. before. Uh, and linking creativity back to problem skills, I think the people who are have got really good problem solving skills are able to come up with lots of different solutions mm. which is being creative thinking of different different ways that you can do things and of course that's drawing on experience what people have done successfully as well as what people have never done before and drawing on examples from different disciplines and areas um, and in your role at the moment, like so, you may agree with this that you, you learn a lot from speaking to people from different backgrounds, from different dis disciplines and subjects, which you don't, you know, when you're you, you're siloed and you know got yeah. a very narrow view of the world. Well, it's interesting to hear what feedback people say from different areas, and you don't always realise what 
their circumstances are and mm-hmm. if you can know what all the facts of the scenario so if you know that your problem sorry if you are thinking about your problem and you can learn more facts about it you can learn more about why that why people would view it the way they view it mm-hmm. or what people's background is or are you can start working out how, how you can best affect the outcome so the way that i think about it as well i don't know if you agree with this is look at the outcomes first so that's what you said you look at what outcomes you want mm. if you can then find out by talking to people and increasing your view of what the problem is or the potential solutions are find out what the facts are you can then think about okay how can i use these facts and adapt them to come up with an outcome that works so mm. rather than looking at the problem i tend to look at what like you said the outcomes and how you can solve the problem mm. Yeah, that's a really, really important point you've made there. I mean, it sounds li- li- a little limiting, t- to put it like this, but you do need to know the parameters of your solution before you start mm-hmm. um, in most cases. So if someone asks you to do something, come up with an idea for this, well, you need to know you know, whether there's a budget, what's the time frame, you know, s- s- sometimes. And those parameters help you frame your solutions. Um, mm-hmm. Sometimes it's it's useful not to have those and just go blue sky but you want to frame your solutions within you know what's possible or or what's required um Mm. and when i plan like for a teaching session for example or an activity or you know even things i do socially you always think well what's the outcome i need for me what does the outcome i need for the business what's the outcome i need for the students what am i trying to get to basically (laughs) because without that you can go all over the place can't you yeah definitely I'm just thinking what you're saying there about parameters. I think that's such a key point, actually, which I was trying to get across, but I didn't realize um, is when you have, when you've worked out what the parameters are, you can really adapt your solution. One thing that comes to mind, and I I know you're a game fan as well, Alex, uh, is designing board games, uh, uh, which is something that I'm very, very interested in. And when I do game design workshops, people can get very, very creative on um, the rules, the cards, the board, the characters, the narrative and all the story, which are absolutely fundamentally important. But they can do it so much so they forget what's the purpose of the game, what's the game trying to do, what's the win condition, what you're trying to, in my case, teach people through the game. Until you've got that absolutely nailed down, the, the creative stuff can actually misguide you. Yeah. You can have a wonderful game, which is very colourful, lovely pieces, but at the end, people say, "Why did we do that?" <laughs> yeah, and it's also when you design, you have to take into mind what strategies people might use. I guess so. When I think about strategies when I play board games, I often think about, okay, how can I get to the outcome quickest? What ways are there? I might not know. So often, I play a game at the moment called Wingspan quite a bit. And I try different strategies every time and that sometimes luck works in them, but you evaluate those strategies, but you always look for what do you think can link you to the outcome the best and mm-hmm. make you better, better than everyone else. Yeah, we've well, got something coming, Alex, because uh, on the, I've got a copy of Wingspan European expansion in my hand as I'm talking to you now. <laughs> I, I really like the game. It's a great game. Um, yeah. I think playing games and playing board games can actually be a way that can help people develop their problem-solving skills because it's just another time to practice. You've got this problem. How do you solve it? I don't know what you think about this. Oh, I mean, I, 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 I couldn't agree a, a, anymore. I mean, I think games are a great way to improve in problem-solving skills. I mean, for two reasons. One, many games are intrin- intrinsically problem-based, mm. you know, um, you, um, and use a complex range of pieces to do so. But I think secondly, and more importantly, most games, perhaps a bit more difficult nowadays, are you know, you work together as a group. Mm. Either You either work against players or you work with players, depending on what type of game you're playing. And in both cases, you've got different people's problem-solving skills and solutions to consider alongside your own. Mm. And often you can bounce off their ideas their strategies of playing the, the game, which increases your own capability. Um, and some games are incredibly clever in the way that they make you think differently about how to solve stuff, which I, I, I reckon might be something that you agree with. <laughs> yeah, I um, I use board games to help teach problem solving uh, skills to young people. Um, mm. And it's remarkable the amount of solutions to problems, but also the fact that when people are solving problems, they can draw inspiration on what someone else is doing 
Mm. And sometimes when you are working against each other or working with people, you could see what someone else is doing and adapt to what adapt to either cover or support or help further what they they are doing. So if I'm against someone, I might see what they're doing and have to adapt to my own solution to stop them from winning versus whilst also making me win. But there's mm. lots of considerations to take into account because sometimes if you stop someone else from winning, you also stop yourself from winning and then someone else wins. Mm. I mean, I mean, I'm a massive fan of uh, role-playing games. Mm. By role-playing games, I mean like Dungeons and Dragons, yeah. which I think is the ultimate problem-solving mm. uh, game um, because you, you take on the role of fictional character uh, and you know you describe problems. You know, Perhaps they've encountered a, a large drain or well and they can see something down the bottom they want to get to. Uh, and you basically say, well, how are you going to get down there? <laughs> I mean, you can leave some clues. You know, Perhaps they saw some planks of wood You know, a few minutes before but very often when you play these kind of games the solutions that players come up with are things that you've never even considered yeah incredibly creative like they all take off their trousers and tie their legs together to try and lower themselves down or whatever but they come up with all sorts of things that you never thought of um and it's great if you play a role-playing game because the person in control then has to respond to the solution they've come up with and come up with kind of the next part of the story so you, you're both working on your problem solving skills in a real fast-paced environment yeah i think it's a great way to get practice of doing those skills and that practice can transfer because you will then start using the same mindset when you're solving problems otherwise so i think that's one of the reasons why when it came to negotiations i didn't feel very limited in the responses or the things i could do when i was doing negotiation assessments the same Mm. with when i was doing assessments that required creativity if you've Mm. been creative in your free time and practiced being it being creative in your free time that can really help Mm. yeah yeah, I, I I agree with that. Um, I, I can think of lots of examples from my youth, all the way back to reading, you know, these reading fantasy books where you make a choice whether you go left or right, you know, at the end of the page, mm-hmm. um, all the way up to the games I play uh, now, which have influenced and helped direct my kind of creative um, uh, approach when I teach. I think... The key to using those things, though, as well, is actually actually thinking when you do them. So I know one of the things that board games have that makes them really good for creative, becoming creative and, sort, and helping you to develop your problem-solving skills is that you properly think and analyse as you go what's going on, especially because in board games, often you're waiting for someone else to take their turn. In that time, you can sit there thinking about what your options are. Um, whereas I think sometimes when you play video games if you aren't thinking you don't get that benefit but if you do think about what you do and evaluate what you do and adapt what you do so Mm. all three of the things that you said earlier you're uh, thinking about what the outcome is how can i win reflect on if it worked well and adapt to go forwards um Mm. if you aren't doing that when you play games like video games you might not get those benefits i don't know what you think about that ian yeah, yeah, I do. I agree with what you're you're saying. Um, so w- when I talk about games, we often talk about ten things that are really important in all games, and one of those is strategy. Mm. I.e., that when you play the game multiple times, you can reflect effectively on your experience and um, come up with new ideas and test them out. Uh, and that's got a massive parallel to me for for pro- back to problem solving skills. Yeah, you know, you know. At trying different strategies and knowing what work and i think as you become better at solving problems you refine that strategy mm-hmm. so now um I, I, i'm probably better at coming up first of all coming up with solutions but also discounting solutions before they've even really formed formed as a thought because i know that they won't work so yeah. i'm much better at narrowing down the pool of solutions uh, to the ones which may get me the outcome I need. I was going to say, it's all about like thinking about what the parameters are. And if you've got experience in assessing and evaluating options, it can turn a lot of options into not many options. I think one thing you're saying there about strategy and implementing strategy, when when you implement a strategy in a board game, having played that board game a few times, that experience can transfer to when you implement a strategy for, let's say, organizing yourself for a semester. So you can come up with a strategy, assess it, and use the same techniques as you've developed when playing a game to work out if it's working, and if not, how can I adapt it to make it work for the future? Yeah, 
Uh, oh, that's, that resonates with me um, as being a game player. I think more generally for students who don't play games, I think there's probably other parallels for them. And there's all sorts of different things in, in personal life and work like life where you can refine your parts of your problem solving skills. I mean, a different example for you, just in case anybody doesn't play games, is that, I mean, I, I'm also a very keen runner. Uh, and I often take a problem with me on a run. Um, I'm not doing anything, not writing anything down, but I'm just thinking. And I think that's a key part of problem solving. Sometimes the solutions need, you need more time to come up with solutions or you need more time just to think them through. Um, circumstance may not allow it. You may need a quick answer to something. But if you have time, then I allow your time, time and space to think reflect on what you've come up with often is gives much greater benefits in the longer run i um, <laughs> longer run. Uh, i think that's so vital actually mm. that thinking time especially when it's a longer term problem um mm. i can't think about how many times i can't n name how many times it is that i've thought about ideas when i've been driving mm. when i've been uh, in the shower or when i've just been sitting there thinking mm. eating my lunch give me some time and putting time in to think about the problem Mm. can help even if and often you come up with these solutions when you're not even meant to be thinking about them because mm. uh, you just inherently reflect on what the problem is and just your brain just ticks over with what the issue is yeah i agree yeah so so are you, have you got any other tips alex how would you develop your problem solving skills if, let's just say you don't play games what would you do to improve your problem solving skills I get practice i think is the key thing for me so practice it could be inside games <laughs> practice could also be for example, if you are giving yourself a volunteer experience, so the careers and employment service have lots of volunteer experience available, if you get yourself in a situation like that, uh, so I got involved with youth work, I found loads of problems and I was able to help solve those problems and develop my problem-solving skills that they could then apply to um, things like my assessment. So getting involved in areas where you get experience in problem-solving skills can be really useful especially where that experience is very easily transferred so like i say volunteering uh, or getting work experience can definitely help especially because they can help you understand what the options are in your field and if they can help you develop an understanding of what the limitations are or potential mm. limitations are in a problem mm. i guess by going outside of your environment to something different a new experience work experience you're just you're generating new experiences new environments which increases your kind of portfolio of solutions that you could offer the yeah. more experiences you get i totally agree with that i was just thinking about how um i mentioned in a digital capabilities episode, episode as well about how i developed video making skills i never had an intention to ever make videos but because that became an option to a salute to a problem that we had which is how can we get content to students on mass in a way that they can find it accessible, all of a sudden we had the solution there. I can make videos. So developing skills that then you can apply to problems in the future, that's another way that you could increase your options and outcomes. Yeah, yeah, I think you're absolutely right. Another thing that really works for me personally um, is uh, I'm a big fan of mind maps, which are like mm. visual pictures which connect together, you know, words and images. Um, I'm particularly a fan of um, a researcher called Tony Buzan, who, who does work on mind maps. Uh, and, and for me, if I've got a very complex thing, I'm, I'm struggling to kind of join together my thoughts, putting them down in this kind of mind map, this picture form, sometimes show me connections or ideas that link together. So that may be another useful tool for people who um, think that they, that they struggle with coming up with solutions to problems. Yeah, I, I totally agree with that as well. I feel like when I'm planning out what I want to do, I will first, the first thing I do often is I make a piece of paper and I draw out a mind map. I don't do it digitally because I haven't quite, I feel like I'm quite as connected to digitally to digital mind maps as I am to physical ones. And it's just a, it's a good way to get yourself to think. Mm. And it's a good exercise to do when you're thinking about what options are and how they connect or what the impacts of them could be. It's a good mm. way to explore, I think. Uh, it also makes you slow down, I guess, as well. Mm. You know, it makes you, by dr drawing a mind map is kind of the equivalent to the exercise. It makes you take some time just to think about what it is that you're doing. It makes you haven't overlooked anything. So just thinking about what we've said in this section so far, we've said a lot of it comes down to uh, working out what the outcomes are, 
mm. that you want to achieve, mm. thinking about what options could be available, looking at the limitations, really reflecting on uh, how your strategy has worked when you've implemented the strategy, mm. uh, practicing those skills that you've currently, um, that you've gotten learned in developing skills outside of university through extracurricular experiences, whether they be getting work experience or something more fun like playing a board game, um, and then trying to um, be creative. I don't think there's anything, is there anything else that you think that you'd like to highlight from what we've already discussed? Well, that sounds like an excellent summary. I might write that down, Alex. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so something else that I thought was interesting that you said earlier, Ian, is about how you didn't think of yourself as someone who's creative. And I felt the same way about myself, actually, when I was a student. So I thought that I couldn't draw and therefore I was not creative <laughs> because I'm not very good at drawing at all. Um, and actually, I was very surprised when I heard someone describe me as someone who is creative. So I just thought it'd be interesting to hear about what you think creativity is, if it's not just the ability to draw. Yeah, I mean, um, certainly that comes up a lot. And like you, I, I, my artwork um, <laughs> won't be on any walls in any galleries <laughs> anytime soon. Um, yeah, for me, creativity is uh, all about coming up with different solutions to a problem, but particularly coming up with solutions that other people would not naturally come up with so go back to that silly pipe example i gave earlier on i think many people if i said you've got a frozen pipe would say let's lag it or perhaps you can pour some boiling water over it perhaps fewer people would suggest using a hairdryer to defrost it mm. i'm not saying no one else would but it's a slightly rare idea and that example perhaps highlights me what i think creativity is coming up with slightly different examples uh, uh, slightly different solutions and i find when i'm in meetings where i'm asked for ideas when i come up with those solutions many of them are as they slip out of my mouth already redundant as in they're not mm. good ideas but sometimes they trigger other people to think oh mm. that's not a bad idea but once if um i think creativity it's not just about you coming up with ideas, but I think I like to think I act as a catalyst for other people's ideas as well. Sometimes people have got brilliant ideas in their brain, but they just need something to start it off. You know, you, 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 I'm sure you'd agree with this, that it's easier to comment on something that you have seen rather than come up with an idea yourself. Mm -hmm. So, So what's your view on, you know, this? I don't know. Then you say, well, I believe it's this. And they go, oh, no, 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 you, you, you know, because you can react to it. So I think creativity is, is helping other people unplug plug themselves as well. Yeah, I think you did that quite well earlier on in the podcast when I was stuttering around an idea and mm -hmm. then you asked me a question and I realised actually, I realised the importance of looking at what your limitations are or the preconditions of the solution would need to be, uh, for example. So that's something that you did earlier that was an example of that. Another question for you, Alex. Though. I mean, creativity is a skill that's talked about being valued. But I mean, what other skills in the workforce do you think are important for creativity? And I'll, I'll, I'll give you a chance to think by just giving a couple of my own, because mm. I think if other people aren't willing to listen to you, um, listening skills, uh, and that feeds into kind of you know collaboration and the communication skills, then creativity can disappear. Yeah. Because when you come up with ideas which are different to the norm mm. you've got to have people receptive and have the skills necessary to mm. consider and process those and not dismiss them out of hand um what about you what other skills do you think are linked to creativity i think critical thinking so the ability to work out how what the options are and evaluate your options uh, and even come up with other options that are available I think what you said there about persuasion is important uh, and the ability to persuade people. I think the mm. boldness is also a really key skill. Mm. The ability to be willing to put yourself out there with that idea because often you could get shot down and being bold enough to say, I've got an idea, I, I think this could be the way forward is a really important skill in that regard. Mm. Um, I also then think after you've come up with an idea, the ability to execute it is important or the ability to know and understand a network of people who can help you execute it. 
Um, so, for example, if you were to say about the solution to your, dra- I think you said about drain problem earlier. Mm. When I first saw that problem, because I've not got any experience, I wouldn't know what to do. But mm. my problem solving might be okay. I know who can co- who I can contact about that. Who could then come in and fix it for me? So that's another way yeah. of doing it if you're not an expert. So I think just to summarize what I just said there, I think a lot of the important skills there are skills that will help. But I think the biggest one out of all of them is boldness and having the persuasive, being persuasive enough to actually get people to listen to your idea. So be able to persuade people, be able to present that idea and being bold enough to even come up, to come out and say it because lots of people I'm sure have very, very good ideas but they might not say it. And I'm very lucky in my workplace that I have people who listen to my ideas. Mm. Yeah, I, I think there's some very, very sensible words in there. I think being bold, having the confidence to speak up your ideas is really important. Mm. Also being um, understanding that other people have process problems in different ways and may need time to think on your ideas uh, and an affliction sometimes that goes with creativity is being over enthusiastic um uh, enthusiasm is good up to a point but you need, do need to give a chance for other people's to mm. build on those ideas reflect on them uh, and, and nurture them to make them their own as well yeah i've got another skill as well that i just realized that links very well to this which is resilience so if you're over enthusiastic about your idea be prepared for people not to accept it and be ready that if people don't accept the idea to come back with an alternative idea. Mm. And that works within their new parameters. So part of that comes in nego- into negotiation. So I know when I get, got rejected for a, um, a series that I wanted to run a, a few years ago, mm. I asked them, I asked the people who rejected me, why, what was the reasoning behind that? And that resilience and the ability to stay calm when I was actually thinking, they've said no to my idea. I was able to work out the reasons why and then come up with a new creative solution that fits into their their reasons why they rejected it. And then they ran with it because they had no reason to say no, because everything they said was a reason not to give the, the grant the idea. I could then come up with a new solution that was tailored to those preconditions. Mm. Yeah, I mean, earlier on you mentioned uh, reflection. And I, I mean, I think that's a very important point here. And I'm going to just link it to perhaps honesty. Mm. I mean, being creative, often I come up with ideas that, Everyone's like, yeah, that sounds really good. And not long after, I realized, actually, no, that wasn't, it's not going to work. And it takes, well, it's brave, I suppose, in, in some scenarios, but being honest with yourself and actually saying, actually, no, 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 this is not going to work anymore. Not doing the politician thing and sticking stubbornly to your idea when you know it's not going to work. Um, yeah, reflection is very, very important alongside problem solving and creative skills. I think what you said when you were talking earlier about your teaching method, you said after reflection that you adapt. So if you can adapt that solution to work, I think that would be really good. If there's a way of adapting it, if you can't adapt it, evaluate, is it actually still worth pursuing this idea or is there another thing you can think of that might work better? Yeah, you're right, because most problems aren't like, here's a problem uh, and come up with a solution and let's see if it works in its entirety. Most problems are much more short-term time mm. time stamps. Like in a lecture, the problem could change minute by minute. If all the students don't get what you're doing or um, have covered things before or got queries you hadn't thought of, you need to react very quickly to that problem and how you're going to count it. So a lot of it is about being adaptable then. Yeah, it's another skill. I think we covered all the skills on the list now, <laughs> Alex. <laughs> yeah. I mean, they are all intrinsically linked, aren't they? And it's very hard to develop one skill in isolation without supporting others, which is great. <laughs> I, when I wrote this plan for the series, I looked at how each of the skills linked to each other. There's 12 skills that I'm doing episodes on, and all of them linked to at least six others. Yeah. And that was a, a very much like, I would only talk about strong links there. Um, and some of them linked to all the other episodes, like Reflection just because mm. of how key a skill it is. So yeah. earlier we discussed what a bit about my advice for problem solving under pressure. I wonder if there's anything that you would advise that shoot people do as a first step maybe when they're under pressure or what advice you would give someone who is in a crisis and having to problem solve. Yeah, I think problem solving under pressure, I mean, I mean, I mean when I would say pressure, it's normally time. Mm. Time is like the key pressure. Yeah. I personally think this is a skill that you can only really develop by actually facing that scenario yourself. You know, it's hard to practice when 
practice problem solving under a time pressure when you haven't actually got a real time pressure mm -hmm. on top of you. Um, um, so pr practice by doing. So find a scenario where you've got to do something quickly. And I think games are a great example there, Definitely. you know, of games have a time time limit on them. And if they don't make a time limit on them. Um, the top two tips are obviously clearly don't panic because the moment you lose control of your ability to come up with solutions, you, you, you're not going to cope well uh, under pressure. So whatever that is, you know, you know, take a breath, get a pen and paper out and start writing things down, whatever it is that, takes away that fear of the time limit on you i think it is really important don't panic and i think you can train yourself in that regard you can train yourself through breathing techniques and whatever it takes to stop panicking um, um the, the second th thing is practice um problem solving not under pressure so you can refine that identification of the problem and coming up with solutions skill so that you can quickly disregard those ones ones which won't work so in the example you gave me earlier on alex about your laptop failing with such a short time window there are lots of other things you probably could have done but because you are well versed in coming up with how to solve problems under pressure you didn't completely panic you didn't have a meltdown and you also knew to disregard several options and focus on the one or two things that probably could resolve your situation mm -hmm. um yeah, so I guess they're kind of my two I two things come to mind. But how about yourself? I think what you said there, the key things were about practice. And I think I would have to echo those thoughts. And even if that practice isn't in an environment that might be that you might think is relevant. So I know with me a lot of the reasons why I'm okay under pressure is because I used to play a video game where where there was often lots of time pressure, people watching me when I didn't have much time to act. That game, I think it was Call of Duty. It was a game where called Search and Destroy where often you were the last person alive, everyone was watching you, mm. and you've got to act quickly. And in those times, by doing that and putting yourself out there to get experience acting under pressure, especially when it's in a bubble where there's actually no consequences, that can be the best because you can really feel that freedom. I mean, when I play the games, I didn't feel the freedom. I would I'd be sad that I lost, but there's that freedom actually what's the consequence of me failing with this? Well, nothing. So having that ability to practice where you're free to fail and properly reflect on that is useful, I think. Yeah, I mean, I think uh, just as I thought a little bit more about what you're saying, I mean, for me, the pressure I face most often is lots of eyes, up to 200 pairs of them watching me mm. teach uh, and watching those eyeballs and thinking I need to energize you and enthuse you, you about my subject and help you learn things. So that's the pressure I face most of the time. Um, yeah, I mean, I've practiced it so much now. I, I, you know, I, I'm not nervous at all. I don't feel any pressure in that particular environment, even when, you know, all the electrics fail or, you know, mm -hmm. <laughs> student put their hands up and say, I just don't get it. Yeah. So I think the practice there is really distilled in, in me. The other thing I do is I create a bit of a persona when I teach, um, Definitely. Yeah, so I'm a, bit, I'm a bit, I'm actually quite an introverted person naturally, but very extroverted when I teach. And that helps with my creativity, you know, helps me open up that particular door in my mind um, using that approach. Yeah, I definitely use the persona times as well to help get, help me to encourage me to do things that will help get better outcomes when I, self, when I feel myself, I'm limited yeah. by my confidence at times. I've only got a few minutes left, Ian, so I just wondered what you thought would be your advice for any student in being successful. That's a great question. <laughs> I'm going to ask you the same thing in a minute, Alex, if you haven't uh, already answered on another podcast. I'm going to go for two things. I could probably give it, I could probably talk for two hours on it. First thing is do things you wouldn't normally do. Mm. Um, so, yeah. Um, if someone says, do you want to play a game? You're like, and you normally think, oh, I don't play games. Well, try it for once. If someone says, I'm going to a seminar on law and you're a biologist and you say, well, I don't do law, go to it. Because it's amazing the amount of times while going to something completely different that you think, oh, my goodness, that's really, really interesting. Or, oh, my goodness, that really links to what I've done. It's amazing the amount of times of those things. That's my first tip. And my second tip, which relates to all the skills. I mean, I'm an absolute bookworm. I've read since I was a very young person, read hundreds and hundreds of books and read, read some more, 
uh, and then read it again if you've read everything you've got. And when I say read, I don't. I'm most. I mostly read fiction, but I learn so much from fiction in terms of my creativity and innovation, in terms of my language skills, everything from history to politics to geography comes up in the fiction books I read. So just read, 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 read. Yeah, you learn so much by reading. Yeah. So they're my two tips. Have you got one? Yeah, I think mine's about taking opportunities. So a bit like what you said earlier about when things come your way, take them. I think don't limit yourself is the biggest piece of advice that I have. Um, and don't limit yourself by in a certain way. Try and become round in a, as round a way as you can do. So for me, for example, I was always nervous that... Well, I was when I started my studies, I was always conscious that I'm a law student. I want to go into law. I want to work in law. Well, let's develop the skills that help me in law. But actually, mm. one thing that made me stand out is the fact that I developed skills that other law students didn't have. So, for example, I developed quite a few skills in marketing because I always thought I'm really bad at marketing. So I went for a job interview in marketing. I, I did tell them I was bad at marketing and they didn't give it me. But then I thought, OK, how else can I develop the skill so that next time people don't think I'm bad at that type of area and I'm actually quite rounded. So mm. take opportunities to make yourself more rounded in skills, but don't just limit yourself by your subject area and that way you can keep your prospects and your opportunities open and you can help out in ways that other people can't mm. or didn't even think were possible yeah and i guess don't let anyone else limit you either mm. um and i guess kind of be uh, metaphorical i suppose problem isn't oh dear that's broken how do i fix it i mean your own next career step could be a problem not as in oh dear if i don't do something something bad's gonna happen but apply those skills to your own yourself and your life plan and your next steps and your choices as well you know yeah don't limit yourself at all thank you very much by the way for your all your advice today professor ian turner i really do appreciate everything that you've said and i think it's so valuable especially with everything you said about problem solving creativity so thank you very much for all your answers and advice Thanks, Alec. This interview about problem solving was really insightful, and as I mentioned earlier in the episode, I really feel that I've expanded my understanding of this broad area. Ian, as ever, is an inspiration, and there is a lot for me to digest from this episode, but here is a few of the key points that I picked out. First, anyone can be creative, even if you aren't good at art. I remember always hearing the word creative and having the fixed mindset that I was not creative at all, so if something was creative, I couldn't do it. It was not until my second year at university when one of the lecturers came to me and said, you're creative, that I actually started thinking of myself as creative. So the point that I'm making here is, you can be creative, anyone can be. So if you follow the advice from this episode, you stand out, you try to think of ideas that others might not think about, and you aren't stuck where the same limitations other people are, you too can be creative. The second key learning outcome that I'd like to highlight today also helps with your creative approach. So what this is, is that when problem solving, especially when you're in a crisis, be solution focused. Focus on what you can do in the time that you have and what options are available to you. Don't focus on the options that are closed and don't focus on what has caused the position immediately. Focus on solving the problem before going back and considering why the problem even happened to begin with. For reflection purposes, it may still be worth having that inquest, but in terms of prioritisation, focus on the issue at hand first. So the third and final key point that I want to highlight is that problem solving means both identifying a wide range of potential solutions and being able to evaluate which of them is best in the given circumstance. Ian mentioned that as he gained experience in solving problems, he learned to be able to quickly rule out some of the potential solutions so as to focus on the more workable solutions. In the episode today, it was mentioned that problem solving and creative thinking skills linked to lots of the other skills mentioned in the series, and I totally agree with that point of view. So some of the key episodes to look out for for when they come out are the episodes on boldness, the episode on confidence, and the episodes on critical thinking and resilience. They are all really helpful for helping you develop your problem solving skills, so I do recommend having listened to those. In the next episode of the series, we're going to be examining the useful skill of organisation. Organisation allows you to be prepared and in a position to solve problems, but it is also so important for success at university and in your later career. In this episode, we will discuss methods of being organised and how anyone can be organised, even if you aren't organised to begin with. If you are interested in this episode, it releases on the 19th of April 2021. 
This episode was brought to you by the University of Derby Skills Team. Production, episode planning and editing was completed by Alexander Wood. Thanks to Stephen Plant for creating the amazing graphics and for balancing the audio of this episode. Thanks also go to Natalia Kodalavar, Tim Zalstra and Naomi Bowers-Joseph for giving feedback for this episode and the series on the whole. Thank you very much for listening.